Black people didn't have the right to vote. On the Edmund Pettus Bridge, police stood in the way. It was the beginning of the bloody Sunday. Dr. King knew that we would be attacked, but he said to everyone that we ain't turning back. So we marched holding hands, yeah. singing, We shall. Super Tuesdays with Ron Bell, talk radio into action. We are in 351 cities and towns throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 22 neighbors in the city of Boston, seven continents throughout the world. We are everywhere, Asia, Africa, North America, South America, Europe, Antarctica. We are international, 16 media outlets on the internet, www.bostonpraiseradio.tv, WRCA, 1330 AM, WBPG, LP, 102.9, WPB. LP 102.9 every Sunday from 5 to 6 p.m. in audio now. You can use your cell phone, 712-432-4402. I'm here with my co-host, Peter Lynn Marcus. What's going on, Peter? Not much. Ha- happy Labor Day. Oh, happy late. But isn't it belated Labor Day today? Labor Day, yeah, yes. La- Labor Day was yesterday, right? Yes. I just want to make sure because I work every day because I labored on Labor Day. Yes. You, you know what I mean? So yes. it's like a lot of folks take the day off. and I mean, how can you they, how can you not labor on Labor Day? Sister Janice, what's going on? I don't know. Oh, okay. We're we going to have to work on that. Labor Day means to labor. Labor. Work hard, right? It's to honor people, everybody who works hard. Well, really? Yes. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about Labor Day? Yes, it the Labor Day it it was cre- it it was signed it was created in 1894 in the aftermath of the Pullman of the Pullman strike. It it was cre- it was it was signed into Congress to ostensibly to honor the two two strikers who were who were killed by police while while peacefully striking against Pullman. Pullman had laid off a lot of people. They also had tried to cut wages, but they. They were they were also renting renting the houses to the people. It was like a co- it was a very controlling company, mm-hmm. and they they didn't they didn't give a break on the rent while cutting wages, that kind of thing. Okay. So they there were two workers, and that that strike made that strike basically crippled the U.S. mail. It crippled a lot of commerce. So it was declared it was declared it was declared illegal by President Grover Cleveland at the time. And he sent federal troops to to break up and ultimately end the strike, and killed killed two people, killed two people in the process. Uh, he, he soon remembered that he was up for election re-election in a couple of years. He mm-hmm. did. He ended up not getting re-elected, but he and the other others realized that people who worked also voted, and they ended up signing the unions pressed for uh, the unions pressed for among other things that the labor be honored the same way that other people are honored and they ended up in one of the they ended up in September of the 1894 signing August or September signing a, a recognition of labor and labor day okay uh the here's an interesting side side note 
the Pullman Company was the largest employer of African American, of freed African Americans at the time. They were employed in, exclusively in the role as porters. They were not part of the strike because they were not allowed to join a whites only union. Really? Yeah. Um, that uh, they they had they had a lot of the same grievance. They had they had a lot of the same grievances. And in fact, the, that one part of the aftermath of this was that about 20 years later, 25 years later, the Pullman Porters Union was for, was formed. The Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters was formed, and its first union president, who became a civil rights fix, fixture, was A. Philip Randolph, Asa Philip Randolph. Okay, great. Well, you know what? I bet you a lot of folks don't even know what Labor Day is, and I'm glad, Peter, you did your research, and I, I, you probably already knew anyway, but to, I think it's important that not only we report the news here at Boston Praise Radio and TV, but we educate our community about various to- topics, various holidays, because sometimes we may be celebrating something that uh, may not have a good history. You know, we know about the brother that's been kneeling on uh, with uh, doing the national anthem, uh, the 49ers yes. uh, quarterback. And, you know, some may have their opinion, but, you know, I mean, it is the Constitution, right? I mean, you should have a freedom of expression. Yeah. Am I right or wrong? Or? You're ab- ab- absolutely. And, in fact, I mean, he's – I mean, he's – on. As, as I said, the – as I said, if even if you ch- even if you choose to – Honor the national anthem or the pledge of allegiance. Your obligation, once it's said, is to make the country live up to it. Make and the demand, con- and demand that the country lives up and to it. And the demand that the country lives. Well, let me read my op-ed. The Super Tuesday. It's time for our super op-ed. I'm going to uh, read the op-ed, which is called "Conscious Comes to America, Part One." America will be electing the next president of the United States in less than 60 somewhat days. It seems like every time we take a step forward, we take two steps back. This was mostly recently evidenced by Donald Trump outlining insults to Mr. and Mrs. Kane, Kane, the parents of the Muslim captain who died in service to our country. Voting is more than ever. Voting is more important than ever. While these crazy things are happening, some good things are happening too. The tide is starting to turn. Last week, a federal appeals court struck down a vote ID law designed to suppress the votes of blacks in North Carolina. They said no to the charade that tried to convince people that such laws were intended to prevent voter fraud. On August 3rd, 70-year-old Thomas Blanton, a Ku Klux Klan member who bombed a black Birmingham church in 1963, the same year I was born, killing four black girls, was denied parole by the Alabama Parole Board. They said no. Okay, they said no. They said no. They said no to the, his request for parole after only serving 15 years of life sentence for murder. On August 1st, Reverend Dr. William Barber, North Carolina minister and president of the North Carolina NAACP, visited Bethel AME Church in Jamaica Plain. This seemed appropriate as Boston has a long tradition of starting things going all the way back to the Revolutionary War. Speaking of going all the way back in history, Reverend Barber reminding us that the key watchword in the U.S. Constitution is not the word freedom, it's the word we. And for those of us who may have forgotten the preamble, we, the people, in order to form a more perfect unit, establish justice and domestic tranquility, provide the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to, to ourselves and our posterity. The revival, time for a moral revolution of values, was the perfect manifestation of the clear parallel between the kind of political Pentecost revival and community organized. Reverend Mary Hammond, who's with us today, well-known community organizer and daughter of longtime Bethel AME pastors, Ray and Gloria Hammond, was a great choice to emcee this event. The event with Negro spirituals and freedom songs, which are rooted in the civil rights movement and community organizing, going back to the movement to abolish slavery. The stage was set with words by a longtime activist with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, SNNC, who shared his experiences during the struggle for civil rights in 1960s, which, when he embedded in the civil rights movement on the ground with S- SNCC during his early days. Sister Simone Campbell from Nuns on the bu- uh, Bus and members of the Sisters of the Social Service uh, gave an impassionate plea to have our hearts broken open to comp- 
compassionate response for the suffering of our brothers and sisters. Next came Reverend Dr. James A. Forbes, author of the Hose Gospel and Senior Minister Emeritus of Riverside Church in New York City. Dr. Forbes shared words illustrating the troubling times we live in today. He compared this with biblical times when people were affected by dehumanization and poverty, questionable leadership, and loss of hope in government and faith in God. Next came testimonies, again, showing the parallel between the kind of spiritual revival and community organizing. In community organizing, we do share stories, which are very similar to testimonies in the church. All the testimonies were authentic and shared by local community residents dealing with the specific social justice issue, including lack of access to higher education, environmental justice, criminal justice, minimum wage, and, and violence. Pastor Ronald Odom, Odom Sr., who spoke about the murder of his 13-year-old son, Stephen Odom, did break my heart for the second time. The first time is when I attempted to provide support and compassion to his family when they came to Governor Patrick's office while I served at the governor's office. Governor Patrick's office senior advisor. Our hearts are tested from individuals of our community to the halls of government as these things are all interconnected. This is about conscience, which has to do with the heart. With an awakening of conscience, we hope comes an expansion of consciousness. As Martin Luther King so eloquently stated many years ago, justice is love correcting that which revolts against love. So we're going to be hearing from Reverend Mariama White Hammond. And she's going to be coming talking about the Moral Monday, um, which is going to be taking place at the State House. But I want to hear from you on the bill, briefly on the bill. And then we're going to be asking Mary, uh, Reverend Mariama Whiteham to come and give us an overview of what's going to be happening. We're going to shake the State House. People from all walks of life, all faiths. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be powerful. Sure. I'm. I'm gonna dis I'm gonna talk a little bit about among the, about the roots of Moral Monday and the one of the and some of the triggers, inclu including the including the atrocious voter voter suppression bill, which was which the Supreme Court fortunately struck down. the the voters the voter suppression the voter suppression bill basic uh, the voter suppression bill was in the Supreme Court's words it was it targeted. It, and suppressed black votes in their words with surgical precision. Mm -hmm. The bill, among other things, vote uh, tar uh, eliminated the first ten days of early voting. It eliminated a lot of Sunday voting. It specified only very few forms of government ID, not all forms of government ID. Okay. Uh, and the Supreme Court looked into how how they came up with those things and why they came up with those things. What they found out, what they found in looking at the reasoning, they found out. That the first ten days were were eliminated because that's when black people were most likely to vote. Uh, they they eliminated the uh, they eliminated Sunday morning uh, Sunday voting because a lot of churches uh, took uh, took their members to the polls right up souls to the polls after uh, right at, right after Sunday services. Mm -hmm. And they and they they and. They looked at which form, forms of ID black people were least likely to have. Things like driver's licenses a lot of times. and So so they required things like driver's licenses uh, right. or gun IDs, things that black people were likely to have. Uh, and they, so... And and by the way, the stats of the the the, the stats of the voter fraud, which was the claimed reason, uh -huh. there were only 31 suspected cases of voter fraud over a 15-year period. That's when nationally not in north carolina nationally where one bill uh, and out uh, and nationally that's with one billion votes casted only 31 suspected those were not even 31 proven cases wow. so uh, it'd be an understatement to say that that's not really a problem that has been documented okay so, so in closing so in so so in closing the in closing the moral mondays movement came in reaction to that in in reaction with to other laws that blocked the use of the uh racial disparities in death penalty cases okay th that kind of thing and uh reverend barber who who helped initiate moral mondays where p where people got arrested uh, people engaged in civil disobedience every monday every monday right and hence the name of it he uh he, uh 
in creating that, he created the first r crossed, uh, the first time in North Carolina that there's been a cross race social justice movement okay. since civil rights. Okay. All right. We're going to be taking the station break. We're going to have Reverend Mariama White Hammond. She's going to be coming and talking more about the event that's going to be taking place on September. 12th did i say it's 23rd did i say it's september 12th? well she's gonna give you the correct date but i know we're gonna be there at 10 30 i believe it's september 12th it's on a monday at the state house you know the state house you know the people's house you can go there you don't have to pay anything we'll be right black
Super Tuesdays with Ron Bell. Talk radio into action. 351 cities and towns throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. 22 neighbors in the city of Boston. Seven continents, including Africa, Asia, North America, South America, Europe, and Antarctica. Everywhere. Australia. We are everywhere. We are international. We, are, we can come right on your cell phone. You can call audio now at 712-432-4402 on the internet. www.bostonpraiseradio.tv. WPPG. LP 102.9 FM and WPPG LP. Oh, that is a mouthful. Every Sunday from 5 to 6 p.m. But I'm going to shut up right now because we have a special guest. We have a treat for you. A woman of God who's come here to talk to us about Massachusetts Moral Monday National Day of Action. I've known this young woman for a long period of time when she ran Project Hip Hop. She's one of the best organized in the world now. She a preacher, a preacher, a preacher. Reverend. Mariama White Hammond. Welcome to Boston Praise Radio. How you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Oh, I'm so glad you just tell us about Moral Monday. I went to the uh, meeting the other night at SEIU and, and you was telling the background why you got involved and with Project Hip Hop and just tell that story and let's tell what we need to do because I'm excited about it. Yeah, well, so we're having this big action on, on September 12th at the State House, and that, uh, that's really exciting. But um, the truth is, people said, well, where did this thing start? And, and the truth is, it started a long, a long way back. Um, okay. So for me, I first heard about um, the Moral Mondays, I think it was around uh, 2009, I believe it was, 2009 or 2010. Um, I would use, I used to lead a uh, civil rights tour every summer. We would go down south and uh, visit sites of the civil rights movement, meet, meet folks who had been involved in the civil rights movement. It was an opportunity for young people to learn their history, but directly from the folks who had made that history. And so every year we would go to Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, we would see where the sit-ins happened, and then we would meet with uh, Lewis Brandon, who was one of the original organizers and who was part of the sit-in movement as a high schooler back in the day. Cool. Um, and so his church, belo the Beloved Community um, Center and, and his church were involved in these Moral Mondays. And I said, you know, what is, what, what is it that you got going on? And he said, you know, he was looking at what was going on in North Carolina and there was just so much work being done to turn back all these things that they had gained during the civil rights movement. All these um, laws that were be being put out that were restricting people's rights to vote. Um, you know, that hurt right there. Yep, you yep. Know, you know I'm passionate about getting people yes, to vote. Okay. Yes, exactly. Wow. I mean, we fought so hard for, for those gains. And, and the Moral Mondays really started in North Carolina because a group of folks, people of faith, um, people of, of conscience said, we can't just sit back and watch these things roll back. And right. so they started um, calling folks together. Um, it wasn't about one organization, but all different kinds of organizations coming together, all different faith traditions coming together. They had Native American spiritual leaders. You had Christian spiritual leaders. You had Muslims. You had Jews. All different groups. Just like a bowl of salad. Yeah, and yeah. Some Everybody fruit. coming <laughs> right. together, right? Right. Um, and so, you know, Reverend Barber talks about the very first time, um, and Reverend Barber really became one of the sort of central figures in that movement. Um, but he's always careful to say, it's not about one person. It was about a group of people coming together that said, um, we're not gonna let this go down on our watch. And so he said that first, um, they called for an action at the state house and that first time they were just, you know, hoping that they'd get 500 to 1,000 people. That was their target goal. Mm -hmm. And about six, thousand people showed up wow. and what they realized in that moment is that what they were calling for was being felt by so many people across the state um, and then the movement has just grown they're able to mobilize you know 20,000 people to show up at the state house in North Carolina they've been as successful in um, fighting voting rights you know the efforts to turn back voting rights, mobilizing around issues of racial justice, economic justice. Um, they fought the uh, transgender bill that, that many people have heard about nationally. They have really mobilized on so many issues of justice in North Carolina. And their message is um, that this is about a moral movement. Right. There are, you know, some people say left and right and conservative and liberal and all of that. And then the reality is there are just some things that are right and wrong. Right. It's wrong if a person goes to work, works their heart out every day, and still can't afford to put food on their table. Right. I mean, what's the point of having a job if it does not allow you to live? Exactly. I mean, we need to talk about those issues. So it started in North Carolina, and then last year, Reverend Barber, 
um, Reverend Forbes, um, um, Sister Simone, um, you know, th there's a whole, uh, Reverend Blackman, started talking because they said, um, you know, that same thing you were seeing in North Carolina, mm -hmm. we think we're seeing it across the country. We see a rhetoric around hatefulness, um, it, some, some crazy conversations around race were caught happening. Women are being assaulted and, and called out their names by presidential candidates. Um, so there were all these same conditions that they had seen in North Carolina were starting to, to be um, on a national scale. And so the idea was, well, maybe this Moral Monday piece doesn't not need to just be in North Carolina. Maybe it needs to be in the ut entire United States of America. Um, and so they started a tour called the Moral Revival. Um, we were able to host a moral revival here in, in Boston. And I actually just read the op-ed piece I wrote about it. Yes, I like, yes. I, actually, I had front row seats <laughs> in my living room because you see how I Skyped it? I yeah. Was, I was like, well, I'm going to watch it. It was awesome. You it, did an excellent job emceeing it. Thank too. you. I mean, we, we had 787 people crammed into our church. We eventually had to turn people down because of the fire code. That's how many people showed That's incredible. up. Uh, we had to set up sites in Roxbury. Then there was a, a, some folks that came together in Lynn that were to watch, the, to watch it together. There were tons of people in their home. In fact, I got a call from a, a good friend of mine, and she said she she emailed me and said, Mariam, I'm not going to be able to make it. Um, you know, I, I don't have childcare. And even if I did, you know, it's, it's the time when my son goes to bed. I, I just think I'm going to, I'm going to watch it live stream. Right. And she said she turned it on and she thought he would watch it. She wanted him to watch it. She thought he would watch a few minutes and then he'd go off and play. Right. She said, as Yara, Yara got up and started singing and she is the song leader for the moral revival. She got up and, and, and started singing she said her son stood up in the living room and started singing along, That's started clapping along with See. what was going on. And she said eventually she, she let him stay up a little bit past be uh, bedtime because he was so into what was going on. And as he was brushing his teeth, he was brushing his teeth and watching the testimonies of folks talking about the injustices that we have right here in our own state. Um, so what's been amazing and awesome to me is I was on the planning committee, and I'll be honest, I said to myself, when Reverend Barber comes, I just don't want us to be embarrassed. We need to make sure that we have enough people. And instead of having to worry about not having enough people, by the time the event came around, we had to figure out off-site locations to put people That's because incredible. we had too many people. Right. So I believe, um, for me, that was direct evidence that the same call that moved people in North Carolina to mobilize, mm -hmm. that call resonates right here in Massachusetts. That's right. We have... Many great resources in the state. I love living here. I've grown up here. But the inequality that is increasing in our state mm. is unacceptable. That's right. And it's not a liberal or a conservative issue. It's about right and wrong. It's about people not being pushed out on the streets. Mm. People are homeless in our city who have jobs. Right. That just and isn't a, right. And a lot of young people. I mean, you see the young people that are hanging downtown that yep. are homeless. It is sad. It is sad. I, I get. What are we number four in the country as far as homelessness? I believe so. I believe we uh, we. I'm trying to remember because I know we're in the I top th ten, I, but I, I know that we actually four. have the highest growth rate of inequality of any place in the country. Wow. In terms of between the haves and the have-nots, how much we're seeing a separation between people's incomes. Right. Um, and so we see these luxury apartments going up at the same time that we see more and more people on the street right. and and more of our folks who are living on the street are families right families who can't find a place to put um, a roof over their heads and you know that is not children shouldn't start their lives out on the streets right and and of course it, it, it affects their school performance because they're course. going back to a shelter and they don't even have a place and then you wonder why they're low performance mm -hmm. And, and I think for, for a lot of us who've been engaged, because we believe, again, right. this is an issue of, for people of faith to stand up. That's right. As a Christian minister, I worship a Savior who didn't have a place to lay his head. Mm. And I know that I am then therefore called to make sure that no other children live through that kind of instability, live through that kind of situation. Um, he had to flee to Egypt because um, there were, uh, the powers that be wanted to take him out. 
But the reality is we still have kids on our street who are afraid, um, not necessarily because of a King Herod, but the violence in our neighborhood is unacceptable. It's got to be addressed. That's right. We have to see shifts in our, in our um, country and in our state. And we are standing up and saying we're just not willing to accept that this is the best that we can do. That's right. So when you talk about the what's going on here mm -hmm. on Monday, mm -hmm. right? What about how many other cities and towns and in the country just going on? Because I know it's going to be live streamed yes. all over. The, and people yes. be on time. Yes. Make sure you're on time. <laughs> I we mean, are it, gathering it, at 10 30 10 30 10 30 that across the street from one, the state house zero doop, doop, three zero right. that's right right on time okay um, because because what you raise is really important mm -hmm. this is a national movement we want to talk about what's happening right here in our state because we have specific issues but our issues are not unique to us um and so on Monday, this uh, Moral Monday will be happening in 25 states. Wow. And the District of Columbia. Um, so I was on a call on Friday, and I hear the folks from Alabama. They were talking about caravans. So they're all be in Birmingham, and they've got caravans. You coming sound like them. You said Birmingham? Yep. Birmingham. Tuscaloosa's <laughs> coming, and Montgomery's coming. Right. And all right. So they talked about the organizing that they're doing. Right. Michigan is organizing. Right. Um, they'll have some folks talking about what's, going, what's been going on in Flint, because that's a still an ongoing justice issue. There are folks in California organizing. So it's amazing and exciting, not just because what I see happening happening here in Massachusetts, but to feel like we are part of something that's really taking off across the country is really, really, really exciting. And we have a number of issues in our city, in our Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. There's a number. It's just so much. We're so overwhelmed. What are three major issues that we're going to be focusing on primarily? Okay. Okay. So, and, and we're kind of at four now. So, okay. But I'll, I'll share where well, we are. You can say four. Cause yes. Because yes. I know it's about so, 40, but. Right. <laughs> so the moral declaration, and I really recommend that folks go online, www.moralrevival.org, and you can read the moral declaration. The moral declaration in its entirety is about 14 pages because it addresses every issue under the sun. And we have Economic justice, mm -hmm. um, the military. Um, immigration. There's so many different issues um, that that we need to work on. But in Massachusetts, we're going to kind of highlight four, and not to say that we don't care about the others, but we right. figured we can't say it all right. on on Monday. Um, so the first is one that I've already talked about. Mm -hmm. um, it, we have a real affordable housing crisis in the city, and it's creating, um, it's really, really exacerbating the homelessness in our commonwealth, and something has got to be done. I don't know if folks have heard about all of the challenges around what qualifies you to officially be homeless and what kind of resources that we have, um, but that is an issue we need um, to talk about. The second... Well, if it, you ain't got a job, you're going to be homeless. Well, that brings that, us to our second okay. pro problem, because the pro reality is even people who do have jobs that's that are right. homeless, so that's where it's... You know, you get people in a job and they're still living on the street. It doesn't make any sense. Let me just say this because I um I actually visited Rosie's place mm -hmm. and I actually went there. For, I actually brought the governor there mm -hmm. uh, one one of the um, visits, and um the people were coming from their jobs yes. to live at Rosie's place, yep. which is a homeless shelter for women, and I could not believe it. Yep, I said. I, whoa this is bad anyway yeah no so and the reality is pre people are being pressed on both sides so one is that the cost of real estate is going up it's gone up exponentially um it makes it impossible for people to find safe accommodations for themselves or their families so that's that's one piece the second piece is um that the the wages in the city mm, and the state mm, mm. have not kept up with the cost of living right. um so we've done some good work I don't want to knock all the work that was done to raise our um, our wage to nine dollars, and that was they took a lot. And ten, you know, so there has been some work, um, but we believe that, and this is our. There's also folks in in San Francisco that are working on this, and New York that are working on this. A living wage in Boston cannot be less than fifteen dollars. I mean, less than fifteen dollars, and you can't find anywhere to live. Um, and so we want to talk and that's about a tough, that's a tough. That's a tough. Right, even on that. fifteen, 15 you're not going to be living large, right? You better but, have a whole bunch of roommates. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. um, so we want to continue to have a conversation about what is a fair wage. All we're asking is that if a person shows up to work and puts their time in, they get enough money. To to go home and have a decent place to live. They don't have to live in the penthouse, but they need to have a safe place and they need to be able to eat. 
And if you're going to work every day and you're still not able to eat and you're still not able to put a roof on, over your head, then there's something morally wrong about that situation. And so we want to look again at that issue of, of what is the wage that we need in order to make sure that people can work and live off of their earnings. Amen. Yeah, we, ju- we, we got to do it. Right. We got to do it. So I, I knew, no I knew you, you got so much fire. That's what, I brought my Bible, right? Because I figured we're going to have church in here because this well, is going to be moral money and this is going to be powerful. And I'm glad you're leading it because you got the fire in your belly. I mean, I mean, you're, you're on fire. And that's that's why I'm, like, I'm going to help this woman because I well, know it's a big task. I'm glad. I'm glad. And there is a whole team of folks. None right. of us are paid or any of that right. to do this. But... You know, I kept caught the spirit and so many others have done. We have a great planning team. And let me tell you, literally every week it grows. Um, So the third issue that we're looking at is this question of um, welcoming the stranger. Right. And that is something we are called to do as people of faith. Right. Um, And we want to talk about two things within that. First of all, our state would not be what it is without the contribution of immigrants over centuries amen over centuries immigrants have come to this state and made it what it is Mm -hmm. and there is no reason that folks who got here 40 years ago should look at the people who got here 40 days ago and look down at them right so we want to talk about the real need to welcome immigrants in our community and to make sure that they have access to um, the kind of services and supports that allow them to be fully productive citizens can and i can I, let me just interrupt for one second because mm-hmm. we were talking about this yesterday a friend of mine they said you have to have like about two hundred thousand dollars to live comfortably in boston <laughs> no true. seriously you no, really do really and true. if we have a bunch of folks that are making good money and, and rich Who's going to be able to drive them around? Who's going to be able to clean up the hotel? So if folks can't live here, it's like, well, who's going to help you all with your money? Anyway, I just figured out. No, that it's, in it's true. Yeah. I mean, the reality is, you know, some people have talking about how they, they built so much. And they, you couldn't have done what you did without people. Like I was on the T yesterday. I don't know if you've heard that there's a big drama between the um, MBTA workers, the folks that clean the T right. and the T and they're wanting to privatize that. Right. And I was on the tee yesterday, and they were, they were not working yesterday because the, that, that challenge is existing. And I walked into my MBTA station, and there was a big thing of, you know, bird poop here. Oh, and somebody Lord. had thrown up from probably having too much of a good time over the weekend. And I said to myself, we don't even think about it. You walk into that tea station, and you expect that there's not going to be paper everywhere. You expect that you can walk down the stairs and be safe. That's because somebody takes the time in the middle of the night to clean up that station and come back again and again. And so when we when people claim who are doing big things and have big jobs that they're doing it on their on their own they're forgetting that somebody came along and took that trash out of your bucket that's right and that's what made your office a place that you could actually do work right. somebody cleaned those windows so you could look out on the boston skyline and we cannot treat those people as if they are not important because they are part of what makes this city work and go. make this commonwealth what it is um and so We need to talk about issues of immigration and how we support um, and honor the human dignity because these are human, human beings who live in our community, who work in our community, and we need to honor that. And within that, we specifically want um, to call out um, the importance of welcoming our Muslim brothers and sisters. That's right. As people of faith, we are incensed when we hear the idea that people would be excluded because of their faith. Now, I'm a Christian, and I'll just tell you, There are some Christians who have done some terrible things over the centuries, and there are folks who are doing it even now. Right. But they don't represent my faith. You can't paint us all with a broad brush, right? There you go. Right? David Duke claims to be a Christian. Well, he and I don't believe in the same form of Christianity, mostly because I don't think he believes in my right to be. (laughs) So for me to say that I'm going to paint with a broad brush and hold a whole group of people accountable for what a small group of people is doing is... Wrong. Inacceptable. It's unacceptable. As people of faith, right. we want to specifically call out that this must be a state that continues to welcome our Muslim brothers and sisters. They are an important part of our interfaith community, um, and they should deserve. They deserve the same level of protection and support, and they should be welcomed. And, and so, respect. those are the two groups we want to talk about in terms of. Um, welcoming people into our state, and we've seen some troubling things, right. some hate crimes that have had happened, some disturbing rhetoric last year around Syrian um, refugees coming to the state and we want to get out in front and say that is unacceptable it is a moral issue and as people of faith we will not tolerate and I'm glad you said welcome because sometimes we because we invite people but you can be disinvited (laughs) 
Right. Right? You could be disinvited. I've been disinvited. I've been asked to be on certain committees and won't get invited to the meeting. But if you welcome, it's right. such a thank you so much. And, and the thing is, you can't like when somebody's <laughs> cleaning your place and then treat them like crap. That's right. You know what I mean? Like, come on. Right. right? So I, I think the, the problem that I have is, you know, people are really quick. To receive the benefits, right, and then question the human dignity of the folks that give you that those benefits, and so we want to push back on that spirit um, and say that we want to be a commonwealth where everybody feels a part, and where we are working together to be the best commonwealth that we can be. And then the last issue that we want to raise is one that you know folks probably don't know as much about, but is something that we really need to pay attention to. So probably most folks have heard climate change is an issue, but they think of it as something that's going to happen somewhere down the line, and we can think about it later. Um, but recently, UMass put out a report um, about what we can expect in terms of climate change right here in, in Massachusetts. We are among the four most vulnerable cities in all of the United States of America. Um, uh -oh. I love the seaport. I, love, I live near Carson Beach. But given what I now know about climate change, I worry that my great-grandchildren won't know Carson Beach because it might have washed away by there then. You go. So when sea level rise hits in the United States, it's going to hurt the most in coastal communities, and we are one of those coastal communities. Um, and so we want to begin talking about what can Massachusetts do um, to affect climate change, and how do we make sure that our most vulnerable communities I live in Dorchester. We are going to have flooding. Folks in East Boston are going to see flooding. Folks in Chelsea are going to see flooding. Mm. I want to make sure that low-income communities are getting the support that they need so that they don't see climate change wash them away. Um, and so we need to talk about well, how Massachusetts takes leadership on that and how we make sure that those who are going to be most deeply affected and don't have all the financial resources to buy a boat or fly somewhere else are going to get what they need to survive. Right. Uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, are we getting callers 617-282-0685? If you're interested in asking our, our Reverend Mariama White Hammond any questions, do you want to know anything about Monday, so you, how you can get involved, please call in and ask your questions now. Yeah, so, uh, you know, those are, the, those are the four issues that we're highlighting. Um, but again, we'll be, you'll see banners out there for voting rights. Um, we've had a, uh, somebody call me today that they're going to bring some folks out to register, not only just to register folks to vote, but if you want, if you're there and you want to sign up to go out and register other people there to vote, you go. Um, we'll have some sign-up tables for you to be able to volunteer. So people can bring banners and all that. Okay, yep. Good. We're also going to have some sign-making parties. Okay. Um, so... If you so, I want to just say people can call in. I'll answer all the questions. But okay. if you want ongoing updates, send us an email at moralrevivalboston at gmail .com. That will send out constant updates um, about every time something changes. We change our automatic response so that you will get the information quickly. Okay. So. And and we also really want a good showing of the clergy. Yes, we do. Okay. Yes, we do. So. Um, the way that it will work on Monday is we are asking the clergy to take some leadership. Okay. Um, as people of faith, we need to stand up, and, and it is our job, literally, mm -hmm. to call out when things are right and wrong and to, and to mobilize people. And so we're asking cl clergy to show up in full vestments, whatever oh. your vestments are, whatever your tradition is, um, to show up in those vestments. And we're going to stand in solidarity with folks who have been directly affected by some of the policies that we've had that have hurt people. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, a small delegation of us will go in and deliver this moral declaration to the governor. Um, we will t sort of communicate to him and hopefully also to uh, um, our, our Speaker of the House and State, State Senate President um, that we want to really open a conversation with them about what it means for, for Massachusetts to be on solid moral footing, right. to really take care of the folks here and do it in the right way. Right. Well, when one of the unique pieces about this collaborative effort, because mm -hmm. of course we have the various clergy representing black, Jew, white, Christian, you know, Muslim, everyone, yes. right? That's one piece. But there are also the other folks that may not be in communities of faith. Yes, okay. yes, yes. So, um, so we've been working a lot with community organizations, mostly social justice organizations that organize around, oh my goodness, all sorts of different issues. Right. So we've got climate change people, we've got um, wage theft folks, we've got voting rights folks. I'm trying to just go through the list, worker organizing groups. I mean, 
you name it, if there's an issue out there, folks are, have been mobilizing as part of this. And that's what's really exciting because what we think is it shouldn't be the faith community over here right. and social justice over here. I mean, that's, that's like saying that social justice isn't a part of our faith. And the truth is every single faith tradition. There you go. Working for justice, um, working so that people have what they need and people are treated like human beings is foundational right. to our faith. Um, and so part of our work is really to bring those together. And what's, what's really exciting to me is, so I, I did activism and organizing for years. Right. And uh, worked around youth issues and youth jobs and, you know, all these different issues. And, you know, those are traditionally very secular spaces, right? Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But what I've, I've seen is there's a real openness in the social justice and organizing community for the importance of spirituality and having a faith presence. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do, whenever we have meetings, um, we do some singing. Oh yeah, um, that was it. that's what I enjoyed. Yes, yeah. yes, we the did spirit. a spirit. Yeah, we brought <laughs> we did a clergy meeting, and we had um, we started off with singing from a Christian tradition. Then we had um, a rabbi do a reflection um, of of the passage from the um, Hebrew Bible. We also then had. Um, a uh, Muslim lay person share a reflection of her, um, what she felt like the Moral Monday was connecting to in her tradition. And it was just really powerful That's to awesome. share um, and, and to make a connection between what we believe in our religious spaces and what we believe needs to happen out in the world. So there is, it's all about making that connection between clergy groups, community groups, and people of conscience. You don't have to believe in any faith to show up. There but you if go. you believe that it's, it's, it's a moral necessity that we treat people with dignity, right. that our public sphere reflect um, a commitment to human beings being able to live and thrive together. If you believe that we don't have to be divided around along is issues of race or class, then we hope you'll come and join us because then you're, you're a member of what we're doing. So I told you on fire. We're going to be taking a station break. Um, 617-282-0685. I don't know what the noise. Maybe the fire guard's moving in here. I don't know. But we'll be right back.
Super Tuesdays with Ron Bell, Talk Radio into Action. We are here with Reverend Mariama White Hammond, and she's going to be giving you some details on Moral Monday. She's going to give you some details how you can get involved. Mariama? Okay. So we are calling for more than 1,000 people to gather this coming Monday, September 12th. We will gather at 1030 a.m. at the steps across from the State House, and then at 11 o'clock we will begin our program. We are looking for clergy to come in your full vestments, people of faith, activists, and all people of conscience to join us. Our goal is to spark a revolution of values. We need to stand up in the political sphere and say that we need a country that honors the dignity of children, immigrants, workers, elders, and all people. We push back against racial hatred and economic injustice and call for a better country with better sets of values. Also, you should know that Massachusetts is not alone. We will be standing that day with 25 other states across the country. We need you to be there. For more information, you can look it up at www.moralrevival.org or send us an email at moralrevivalboston at gmail.com. We hope to see you this coming Monday. Amen. Amen. So make sure you're there. Super Tuesdays with Ron Bell. I'll see you next week at 11 a.m. shop. I want to be there. I will be there at Moral Monday on September 12th as well. So make sure you're there. See you next week.